My name is Eileen Miyoko Namba Otsuji, and that's a Japanese name, and uh, I am of Japanese ancestry. My age is 69 years old, and today's date is September 18th, 2015. We are located in Sacramento, California, and I am sitting here with my friend, good friend and colleague, Mary Tsukamoto. My name is uh, Mariel Tsukamoto. I'm 78 years old. Uh, today's date is September 18th, 2015. Uh, we are in Sacramento, California. And I'm sitting across with my good friend Eileen Otsuji. Uh, we are colleagues serving on the Japanese American Archival Collection Board, among other boards. So hi, Marielle. It's really a pleasure to sit with you again. And what I'd like to do very much today is to talk about your mother, Mary Tsukamoto. Um, she has a grand and great legacy in Sacramento and Elk Grove, California. Well, I appreciate the opportunity, Eileen, and, and I am anxious to tell my mother's story because uh, although her story is unique and she leaves a lasting legacy, I believe that her story is typical of many children of Japanese immigrants. Her father came from Okinawa in 1893, and she was my mother, Mary Tsuruko Dakuzaku Tsukamoto, was born in San Francisco in January of 1915. And during that time, there was uh, a lot of feeling of anti-Asian sentiment on the West Coast. There were laws that prohibited anyone from uh, Asia owning land, acquiring citizenship in the same path that Europeans had, so it didn't matter how long you were here. Not until the McCarran Act was passed in 1952 could Japanese immigrants apply for citizenship. So she grew up in an atmosphere of knowing that she was of Japanese ancestry and not a real citizen. And this is something that I know affected her. They moved from San Francisco to Fresno for a short time, uh, met with, uh, with a lot of uh, discrimination and hardship ended up in a small rural community called Florin, California. And there, uh, she was sent to a segregated school. Only the Japanese children were there. It was uh, stated in the board minutes that uh, these children are unable to learn. So when you say board minutes, what are that, you referring to? You know, to? each school district had a school a, board. A, a school board. And there were independent small school districts. So Florin, which was a small rural community, had its own school district. And it was Florin Grammar School. The Japanese children were uh, sent to school in the old building, which was on the east side, uh, on the west, east side of the railroad tracks. The new school was built on the west side. So between uh, 1921 and uh, 1938, that school was segregated. When she got to high school, you know, there was only one high school. She went to Elk Grove High School. And while she was there, uh, she had a, a, a wonderful mentor. There was a young teacher named Mabel Barron. And I think Mabel was a rebel. Uh, Mabel taught the speech uh, and drama class. My mother uh, was very good with um, with speech and drama, and there was an oratorical contest that was sponsored by the sons, the daughters of the Golden West. And Mabel uh, sent my mother's name on as the best speaker from her class, and was she was, you know, so elated that she would be able to be in this oratorical contest. And later on, the principal, Mr. Smedberg, uh, came and talked to her and said that there's been a mistake. 
that people like you are not eligible to be in this speech contest. And of course, my mother was just devastated. So that she was as a, because of her ancestry? Because so of her ancestry only. Racism. You know, Caucasians could. And I think specifically, Japanese people could not participate. And uh, my mother describes being so elated and proud to walk down the halls of Elk Grove High School. And after she got the news from the principal, she said she just felt like shrinking into the walls and to, to become invisible because she was so devastated and ashamed of being Asian, you know, because now you're not a real American. So Japanese specifically, right? Specifically of Japanese ancestry. Mabel, on the other hand, was livid. She was not one of these teachers that sat back, and I'm sure she gave him a lot of trouble. Mabel took my mother aside, and she coached and trained her to be an outstanding speaker, and that is why later in life she was such a great communicator. And Mabel found other organizations, mostly uh, Japanese Christian groups, that held oratorical contests because their speakers were not eligible for these other contests that were going on in the schools. And my mother won a trophy uh, at an oratorical contest, and that, you know, I think helped bolster her confidence again. I'm sure Mabel did other things, but uh, during that time, in the 1930s, the University of California at Berkeley had no tuition. It was free. My Aunt Ruth, who was two years older than my mother and the eldest in the family, was given permission to go to Berkeley. You know, both my uh, aunt and my mom were really bright. And so my Aunt Ruth went there. She worked in a, in a house as, I think, a live-in maid. You know, had her room and board that way and, and some spending money and, and graduated from uh, Berkeley with a degree in biological sciences. Two years later, when my mother graduated from Elk Grove High School, it was uh, determined that she would go work in the fields. You know, everybody had to help out. You had to pick strawberries and grapes and work in the fields, and, you know, that's how the family got to eat. So what year was that? I can't remember. I think it's 1930s sometimes, probably uh, 1933. So maybe the Depression years? Yeah, it was, it was right in the middle of the Depression. Mabel wouldn't have it. She went into the strawberry field several times and just harangued my grandfather until he finally admitted, okay, Mary can go to college. Because Mary, uh, uh, Mabel said, you know, Mary is bright. She has to go to college. In addition to that, Mabel drove down to Stockton to what was then called the College of the Pacific, it was a small private school that was uh, owned and uh, run by the Methodist Church. And Tully Knowles was the chancellor. And I don't know how she talked him into it, because Tully said, it's too late, all the scholarships have been given out, I'm sorry, you know, we, we don't have anything to offer her. Somehow, Mabel talked him into taking money, I think, out of another fund. He paid for her first semester's tuition. Mabel got her uh, a place to stay with a local doctor, uh, arranged to have her be a janitor in the science building, went back to Elk Grove High School and talked to teachers, remember this is the middle of the Depression, to pledge to give my mother $5 a month spending money. Wow. And further, she asked uh, teachers and friends for clothing, which she Mabel was a, a, a skilled seamstress, and she made a wardrobe for my mother. Can you imagine that? What a wonderful teacher. Two years later, Mabel was no longer teaching at Elk Grove. Do you think that was uh, retribution I'm sure she and did punishment? other things. I, you know, I'm sure, I, I don't know, but uh, Mabel was not one to sit back and uh, 
she was willing to fight the establishment. But my mother, because of Mabel, wanted to be a teacher. And when she went to Pacific, they told her, oh, I'm sorry, you know, people like you can't become teachers, which was true. Even though you had a degree, most places, you, know, you, you didn't have job opportunities. And um, my uncle was uh, accepted into Bolt Law School, which is a very prestigious law school at Berkeley. But he dropped out because he knew that unless he had money for his own practice, he'd never get hired as a lawyer. So he came home. And that was the environment in the 1930s. My mother, unfortunately, had um, juvenile arthritis that she it, it started acting up when she was in high school. And by the time uh, her third semester came around, the middle of her junior year, it became so severe that she could no longer work and uh, had to quit and come home. Uh, she married my dad, who was a farmer, and uh, his parents lived with us on the farm. And that is what she did. She was uh, a talented pianist and had been the uh, Methodist Church uh, pianist for a number of years, all through her high school years. And so she played the piano at the church. Uh, she was active in what was formed as the Japanese American Citizens League, kind of in response to the anti-Asian sentiment along the West Coast. It was a national organization. There were different chapters. There was a Sacramento chapter, a San Francisco chapter, Sacramento, you know, all over, uh, mostly in California. And uh, that she was always active in community and church things. Her one dream to be a teacher could not be reached at that point in her life. So how pervasive was that racism that your mother was facing? She was educated. Many of the Issei's and Nisei's, of course, you know, did not get the opportunity to have an American education. But your mother, and especially being a female, was a pioneer in going to the university. You know, I don't think my mother was the only one. That, well, not the only one, but very right. few, because, you know, there was the cultural attitude right. of, you know, well, girls will, you know, stay at home and then maybe go to city college or just get married and have a family. But they were supposed to be homemakers. I think it wasn't as pervasive as in some other cultures, because in the Asian culture, there was always respect for academic knowledge. And um, the minister and his wife were a strong influence in all the lives of the families. The minister was an aristocrat, and usually most of the people that came from Japan were the peasants. You know, they had nothing to lose. They left because there was, you know, Japan was a, a, a society that was uh, based on class and caste. And if you were at the bottom, you know, like European serfs, you could never move up. And so many of them came. The, the minister, Reverend Sasaki, was an aristocrat. And he was the firstborn son, which meant that he was the heir apparent. Uh, he leaves his little land. He marries uh, this... A young girl who came from, he said, a better family because Mrs. Sasaki attended finishing school with the emperor's sister. So she was very cultured. So they and brought... here she came to this little farm community. They had five children. Can you imagine a minister's salary in a poor rural community where just farmers? And the Christian community was always smaller. The Buddhists had, you know, a bigger congregation. They had a bigger church. They had, a, they had more money. But the Christians were the poor ones. So at times, Mrs. Sasaki, who was an aristocrat, schooled with the emperor's sister, had to go out in the fields and pick strawberries mm. to feed her family. But she did something else. 
she, you know, they would have school after school. So they would go to, you know, grammar school or high school. And then afterwards, there was Japanese language. So they, you know, most kids came home from school around three o'clock and they went to Japanese language school. And in that Japanese language school, Mrs. Sasaki and Reverend Sasaki did some amazing, wonderful things. They taught the kids to do Shakespeare. I don't know whether they did it in English or Japanese or what. They did samurai stories. And she taught them correct Japanese and correct manners. You know, these were country bumpkins. And, uh, but she taught them proper etiquette which was amazing because many other communities didn't get that. She taught them a refinement. And I believe that one of the things that influenced that congregation because of her background and her, uh, both of their educations is that many of the Christians did try to go to college. Mm. So it wasn't that unusual. You know, my dad, even though he couldn't, he couldn't afford to go, but um, he, he went to junior college couldn't graduate because it was the middle of the depression and my grandfather was getting older right, so he came work. home so there was a respect for education so as far as your mother she went to the what is now known as the University of the Pacific in Stockton did she graduate no from she there? didn't graduate because uh, the middle of her junior year she had to uh, quit and come home oh was that medically or well, the, you know, her arthritis was so severe that she could no longer work, and then, you know, she couldn't afford to stay there anymore. So at what point did World War II... S well, she came home in the evacuation. Uh, 1936, 35, 36, I can't, and, um, you know, then she married my dad in 1935, and then JCL. And she was, was active, active in the Japanese American Citizens League and in the church, and so, you know, the... the she was seen sort of as one of the young Nisei leaders. Uh, Nisei is a word that's given to the second generation. Uh, the first generation are called the Iseis. And remember, in any culture, it's the elders that run the church. That's right. Well, so, in, so, in Japanese right, all culture... The, all the first generation, they're, right. They're given they all the, the respect. They were the ones that ran the church. They were the ones that ran the community. But this new civil rights organization called the Japanese American Citizens League, that was run by the second generation because they were the ones that were vocal about justice, equal rights, and they did speak out. In fact, it was the Japanese American Citizens League in Florin that desegregated that grammar school in 1938. They How approached did they the do board. That? They approached the board and said, you know, we think that uh, it's no longer necessary or, you know, they, they could see no difference in uh, academic uh, and language skills. And, and besides, I think the school district is facing the fact that they needed the space for the other kids. So it wasn't just on the basis of, well, it's, you know, for just reasons we're going to desegregate. They wanted the two there's, buildings. As a practical reason. As a practical reason. And, and uh, probably the, the people in the community that were strongly anti-Asian were no longer serving on the school board. Hmm. So, you know, that changed. And it wasn't that difficult to make that change. Everybody went to the same high school anyway. And in that environment, World War II started with Japan attacking Pearl Harbor. Can we go back a little bit, regress back to JACL, Japanese American Citizens League, and the so the Iseis and, of course, the older Niseis w were getting to be college educated. And so they were trying to develop a strategy to f fight the racism, you know, that the Japanese families were facing. So what they were thinking was they talked about assimilation and that to try to be as American as you could possibly be, to speak English, you know, to dress like, you know, everybody else in the school and not to set yourself apart. And so can you comment on that? 
because I think it worked well when the Japanese Americans went to the concentration camps. Well, but, you know, I think I think you stated it very well. First of all, uh, Japanese culture has a deep respect for uh, authority, you know, it, and authority in the family too. You know, the father was the head, the parents were in charge. The the if you were uh, a high school student that had a job in the 1930s, you didn't get to keep that salary. If you had a job and it paid money, you gave it to your parents because you oh, were helping true. to feed the whole family. When, when they had eight or nine children, they worked on the farm. Nobody got paid. It was for the family. So the family structure was very, very strong. As many immigrants, they wanted something better for their children. That's right. And I think right. the Issei's, although they didn't speak English very well, uh, many of them couldn't read English, they understood they didn't have the same rights and certainly had no right to vote or do anything else. They knew that unless they could get their children educated, they would always be at the bottom. So there was value and pushing academic skills. And sacrifice. Even, and sacrificing Self, for that. Even though they knew that if their child graduated with a degree from college, they might not be able to enter that profession. So that was your mother's situation, too. She that had was my mother's situation. Credential. She wanted to teach, but at the college they said, oh, you know, people like you can't get a teaching job. And she understood that because she all she had to do was look around. There were no other teachers in the mm. schools that she attended. I think there were pockets of people that were teaching. Uh, Chune Obata, who was a well-known uh, artist, was teaching at UC Berkeley in the, the 1930s. Of art. Yes. But that was very, very unusual. There were other people that actually had degrees. There were people that were doctors, that were pharmacists, but they probably got the degree outside the state and then came back. And then they practiced within the they, community. Within the community, and, and they had their own Japanese practice because they would not be accepted outside the community. That's right. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think there was always the hope and the dream. You know, my mother and, and I know that your parents, too, they believed that somehow... In America, there would be a chance for the immigrants. You know, that is the dream, uh, that this country will offer an opportunity for a better life for the next generation. And they were willing to sacrifice and to work hard and instill the values that would make their children accepted into society. It just so happens that in Japanese culture, you know, much of the value system that they brought from Japan is directly in line with what the pilgrims believed in. Hard work, honestly, honesty, cleanliness, and godliness. Now, why do you think that the Buddhist church calls themselves the Buddhist churches of America? The Buddhist church offers Sunday, you know, a uh, Dharma Christian education, or I mean, you know, education, Buddhist education for their children on Sunday. In Buddhism, they don't go to, you know, a building to have a service on a day of the week. The only time they use the building, somebody dies, right? Well, it's the temple, so they go there. This is my uncle in Japan, my father's uh, sister's husband was a very um, highly respected school teacher and principal in their village in Japan. And so when he came to Sacramento to visit, of course, I took him to the Buddhist church. And he said, oh, the children are here for Sunday school. He says, oh, that's very interesting. And so I asked him, what do you do in Japan? He says, we don't do that. He says, we have the temples. We go when we feel like it or if there's you know an occasion to do that. But he says they're raised with that philosophy every day. It's not something that you go on Sundays right. to learn. It's it's in the home, you know, it's in mm -hmm. the attitudes, it's behavior, it's what you do. So I always thought that was an amazing philosophy. That's part of 
trying to assimilate, to be accepted in the society, you have to be Christian. Um, you know, that has been what, what society expects. So when the Buddhists came, they wanted to look more Christian. And so they adopted many of the Christian practices, although they were able to keep their Buddhist religion. You know, and now we have a lot of non-Asians that are Buddhists. Oh, yeah, it's becoming right, you know, very it's, mainstream. It's yes, becoming very integrated. And very integrated and very accepted. And, you know, people understand Buddhist the philosophy because it's more of a philosophy than, you know, believing in, there, a, in yeah, a God. It's a matter so, of uh, beliefs, right, not and, belief. You not know, belief. And, and I know that we've sort of sidetracked, but I think that's an important issue because the basis of the communities was the religion, whether it was, well, it was, it was Buddhist there. or Christian. That was the glue. It was what held the community together. They came for the various cultural events. And, you know, for the Buddhists, I mean, every person knows that the Buddhists in the summer have obon, and they know that if they go there, they're going to get great food, and they'll have, you know, booths and dancing, and, and, and it's sharing the culture. So do you know what obon is, just to put a little background here? Yeah, why don't you explain it? So, I, I think for uh, StoryCorps and for the record, I think it would be good to explain why that is such an important cultural event. Obon happens in July and August, and what it is is it's based on a historical story, but ultimately what we do now is paying tribute to those who have, you know, passed away. And we are showing appreciation and gratitude for all that they have left us and done for us. So we talk about um, supporting each other. So there was that respect for the elders. Well, it was because of the elders that we, the next generation, and then the generation after that are successful, well, educated, you know, and it's because of their work and their belief and their self-sacrifice. So it all revolves around gratitude and appreciation. So th I think, and selflessness, and that's what allowed people in camp to survive as well as they did because it wasn't about me, me, me. It was about what can I do for you to help or how can we do this together? So they created the schools, they created, you know, the activities for the children and the adults of all ages. But anyway, you're right. It is part of the... Uh, centuries-old Japanese tradition. And so it could be based on Buddhism, it could be Shinto, it could be just, you know, Japanese values. Right. But that was what held everybody together. And then in America, of course, we're a very diverse society. So we can hope to hold that all together. But, you know, you're right. That is, you know, when, when I'm going to start talking about what happened uh, after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, and, of course, that was just devastating. And... I think people knew that there was going to be something that was going to happen. I mean, there were uh, problems uh, politically between the Roosevelt administration and Japan, uh, partly because Japan was colonizing Asia. They had taken over Korea. What is now Taiwan used to be called Formosa and was a Japanese uh, territory for, I think, 40 or 50 years. Japan had the Manchurian coast of China, which incidentally has all the oil under the sea. And, you know, when you look at war, it's always about oil or money. Well, my father said that. My father is Kibe. He was born in the United States in Sacramento County, but raised in Japan. He went there when he was five years old and stayed until he was 17. And he was always very interested in politics and government, you know, even as a child. So he has always told me that um, when we talk about Pearl Harbor, it makes it sound like the, you know, the Japanese were just doing it, you know, unilaterally without probable cause. But he said that going back to World War One, and then in the 1930s, he said the United States was also doing their colonizing, and Russia was moving in, and you know, and I don't know, you know, the history that well, but there was all this political and you know um, upheaval, just like we have now in the Middle East. And he said that 
the United States had embargoed Japan so that they could not get their oil and their natural resources. But, you know, when you have, you know, the news coming from the West in the United States, of course, things are slanted. So we know that as we grew older that we had to look at, you know, all of the, um, the factors and be objective. And so that being said, Pearl Harbor happened, and your mother, I want to get back to your mom, your mother was in Florin, and she was an educated woman, and the Issei's, her parents, probably didn't speak Japanese, or at least, you know, the community as a whole, the Issei's. What did your mother do? Well, uh, yeah, you're right. Um, there are many people that uh, did not read or speak English. And so uh, when it was apparent that we were going to be ordered out, the my mother, as a secretary of the Florin chapter of the Japanese American uh, League, decided that she could serve the community by making sure that information that was coming from the Third Army, you know, it was almost, it wasn't quite military rule, but, you know, they were ordering us out. They put signs up. People who couldn't read didn't know what was on there. Uh, she would go around and, and serve as an interpreter, and she also offered that service to the military commander that was in charge of um, taking people out of the area. They called it an evacuation, which was interesting because we weren't being saved from anything. We were going to be sent to prison. But they told us it was an internment camp, and I don't think people understood it was a prison. And I'm going to tell one story because she knew that Mrs. Kimura had a, a child who was born severely mentally retarded although he was, uh, I think, almost 30 years old. He could not walk. He could not speak. He had to be diapered. And he was small, about the size of a, 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 a nine-year-old child. And so she would tie him on her back, and she would go out and work in the fields. And my mother had the unenviable job of telling her that she couldn't take him. He had to go to a hospital, and they sent him to the Stockton, what they called the insane asylum at that time. How old was he? He was 30-something. Oh, my. But he had been retarded all his life, and she fed him, she diapered him, she cared for him, carried him around on her back during the day as she worked. And we were going to leave in May. We already knew that. And you're saying we, but tell me how old you were. I was five. Okay, five years old. The whole community was going to leave. Everybody on the West Coast was going to leave. And they came a month before we had to leave. They didn't even give her that time. And they came in a white panel truck, and there were two guys in white suits with, uh, what do you call it? Uh, oh, from the, in the mental institution. Right, from the mental institution with... Uh, straight jacket a straight jacket and they ripped him out of her arms put him in the straight jacket and put him in the back of that truck and drove off that's horrible that's it was just horrible. horrible my mother just couldn't get over it and all she could do was hold mrs kimura and they just cried wow. so what happened to the young man during the war and then after when the war we were, were they were, reunited right no we were sent to fresno May 30th, and um, middle of July, they received word that he died. Oh. He, his mother cooked for him. What kind of food was he getting? He didn't know any other language except Japanese. That's he only true. knew his mother. He probably had the mental age of a three- or four-year-old. So why do you think the military acted the way they did and not to make an exception in that case? I think they made a decision that all persons that were not able to walk, that were disabled, would not be in the camps. Just as they, you know, the, the story that I tell when I talk to fifth graders, I talk about people not being able to take their pets. And there's a picture of a dog that gets left behind, is so devastated and, and doesn't eat and starves to death. They, the family gets notification that, you know, the dog died. Well, 
If you had 120,000 people, most of them living on farms, how many dogs do you think there would have been? A it lot. was not possible. And I know in Sacramento County, nobody has told me for sure, but I do know that one of my friends had to tie his dog up on a post as they left on the train to Fresno. Well, I'm sure the dogs like got exterminated. We didn't get very far in the story. No, but we talked but about I, a lot of interesting things. <laughs> but, you know, my mother was a dedicated educator. When she came back, when we came back in 1945, and, of course, you know, I think there are people that will tell the story of what happened in, in, inside these camps. Uh, she wanted to be a teacher, and uh, she had that opportunity because Isabel Jackson, who was the principal and superintendent of, of Florin Grammar School at that time, gave her that chance. And she had a commitment early on to make sure that what happened to us in 1945, 42 through 45, would never happen to another group again. And we know that Executive Order 9066 was never had a ruling by the Supreme Court as being unconstitutional. It was just uh, uh, approved as a military necessity. Patriot Act Two has come back. Arabs and Muslims after 9-11 have again been targeted. She wanted to make sure that this story is told. She gave a collection to the California State University, and it's housed in the library. All of the information that she collected and other people donated from their experience during World War II is housed there. That uh, collection is going to be digitized and available you know, worldwide. And the reason why that is, that is important is if you don't tell people of the next generation of the mistakes that have occurred and, and the, the horror and the devastation that could happen as a result of injustice, it will happen again. It's already happened, but not to the degree that it happened to us. So can I, you talk about what were the mistakes that the United well, States and the President of the United States made? Okay, first of all, 120,000 people forced to leave their homes without charge, because under uh, the Constitution, if you are charged with a crime, you have the right to legal counsel. We were not charged, so we couldn't have legal counsel. We were just detained, and we were held, most people, for three and a half to four years. That's unconstitutional, and it should not happen again to any degree in the future. If you let that happen to one group, it will happen to another. And because of that, she donated the collection to Sac State. We use that collection at the California Museum of History to educate almost 5,000 students a year, mostly fifth graders, in a partnership with the Elk Grove Unified School District, the California Museum of History, and the Sac State Archive Collection. That's a huge number of students to educate every year. And, you know, and I see that as my mom's legacy. The other thing that she fought for was redress. Under the Constitution, if a group of people have had some injustice or wrong done to them. They can petition the government for redress. In 1988, the Civil Liberties Act was passed, and we got authorization from Congress to get an apology and reparations. It wasn't going to cover everything, but it was $20,000 for anyone who was still alive in 1990. My grandparents were gone. and But that's a legacy. Redress, I think, is important because there's less likely a chance that it will happen to another group again. Well, and But there's no guarantee. And it's also that if our government, well, it's actually our government and our c Congress and the people, the grassroots lobbying, supported the passage of the redress bill, which means that our country could make a mistake, but we can also fix it and acknowledge that mistake. Right. So and no I other country has ever apologized. And done that right. No. So I think your mother's legacy is 
helping us teach the next generation about democracy, citizenship, um, the import importance of voting, understanding your government, um, understanding you know current politics, and especially now with the presidential candidates. You know, we have some who are qualified, some who are not qualified, but we need to teach them how to, you know, determine, you know, the factors that make for a good president. Yeah. Well, thank you for this opportunity, Eileen. Well, thank you, Marielle. As always, you're very informative. <laughs>